Texas is now a potential terrorist problem. New audits show that his team is more interested in getting illegals into America than checking out their past and known terrorists are slipping through. One former border chief has even raised the prospect of another 9-11 attack brewing. Can it really be this hard to figure out who left a bag of cocaine in the White House? Experts say no. One even said it would take him 30 minutes to identify who did it. Biden's CDC has gone more than woke in its latest notice. It is now giving advice for trans and non-binary individuals who are seeking guidance on how to chest feed their baby. And the great one Mark Levin said Target is banning his upcoming book because it doesn't want to hurt the feelings of Democrats. For stories like these and more updates all day long from your favorite news outlets, go to offthepress.com. America's fastest growing news program with Steve Gruber. You've got to put America first. You do that by voting and bring your friends to do the same. Delivering the latest news, observations, and opinions with the entire Real America's Voice team. America's Voice Live starts now. Welcome to America's Voice Live. I'm Steve Gruber. Today, Thursday, July 6, 2023. Let's get to the day's top stories. And thank you so much for being here and sharing time with me. President Joe Biden is rolling out his Plan B for student loan forgiveness. We'll dive into the details with an expert guest coming up. Meanwhile, China's top diplomat is under fire for some racist remarks that were supposed to unify China's neighbors. We'll share those comments. And later, are sex offenders getting passed from school to school? That's what the evidence seems to indicate. Those details and much more coming up on America's Voice Live for a Thursday. Let's start here. Because there are a pair of big stories today that have everyone talking, and we should dig into both, and we're going to. One is the discovery of cocaine, cocaine in the West Wing of the White House. Unbelievable. The second is the scorching opinion handed down by a federal judge that declared the collusion between the Biden team before and after the election along with the DNC censoring the content of social media sites to further their agendas while silencing conservatives every step of the way. The judge called it the biggest assault on free speech in the history of the country. And we're going to explore that. Well, we will try, but of course, the White House isn't saying anything at all, per usual, and directing anyone with questions to go, well, go somewhere else, and I'll get back to that. But first, think about the past couple of weeks at the White House. A transgender activist pulled up his shirt to show off his breast job to the world from the South Lawn. Yeah, it was a real boob move. Yes, it was. Then the White House violated all etiquette involving the American flag, flew the LGBTQRSTUV++ flag in the middle of two American flags, hanging from the White House itself. That is a violation of all flag etiquette. We've also learned about the FBI and DOJ slow walking investigations into the first junkie Hunter Biden, of course, allowing him to skate on a pile of felony charges that anyone, anyone else would have faced if they'd failed to pay millions of dollars in taxes while setting up elaborate schemes to hide the move. And then comes the discovery of cocaine. Cocaine in the West Wing of the White House. And as soon as it happened, well, the Hunter Biden jokes were flying and the left wing politicians and media flew into battle mode, circling the wagons and attacking Republicans who, as far as I can tell, did not drop off blow in the White House. Yes, it's been a blizzard of bad news and worse optics for old Joe, but like I said, I never thought it was Hunter's and found it much more likely that the Coke belonged to old Joe. You know, there's nothing like a big fat line and a cup of coffee to blast off into your morning. 
But it's far more likely that we will never know who delivered a midsummer snowstorm to the West Wing. And God only knows the Democrats of the Biden administration will never, never confess to any wrongdoing. This is not a two-tiered system of justice. This may qualify for a three- or four-tier system of justice. I mean, if you can afford to lose your fix near the Oval, you can probably afford to avoid detection, if you know what I mean. And the media. Well, here's how they're deflecting and ignoring the obvious story here, Hunter Biden. Of course, I'm not saying it was Hunter, but we know the first son has been and probably still is a drug addict. Listen to this. Entrance. I've been through that entrance. It's uh, There's a canopy right there. It comes in off the street. And then you go in there. There's a bunch of cubbies where you put your phones. If you're going to one of those restricted areas where you can't carry a phone, uh, like the Situation Room or somewhere else, uh, where people can put other belongings. Uh, and it was found right by where those cubbies are. So that could be a staffer. That could be a member of the press who was there for a specific interview with someone on that side of the West Wing. Uh, what they're going to do is look at the video. Uh, what does the video tell you? Was it Friday? Was it Saturday? Uh, was it there before and just unnoticed? Uh, they'll look at the logs. OK, who signed in? Who were they going to see? Uh, but there's more than that. The powder has been sent to Fort Detrick for a second round of testing to see, okay, it tested positive for cocaine. Is there anything else in it that could be hazardous or weaponized? Uh, the container it came in, which is about the size of a postage stamp, like a dime bag, Ziploc, uh, they'll be looking to see if they can extract a print from that or DNA. So they're going to go through a lot of motions before they are at the stage where they're going to need to interview people. Buying a dime bag? That guy sounds like he's speaking from experience, but I digress. As we joke about Hunter and Daddy Warbucks cutting up lines on a portrait of George Washington on the Resolute desk, there are some very real concerns here about the substance clearing security to get dropped inside the White House in the first place. Think about that. And the press actually asked some questions about that because it's important. If, if that gets in, what else gets in? Here it is. This episode kind of shines a light on the fact that you can bring in illegal substances into the White House. So what's preventing a visitor from bringing in anthrax or something that's not magnetic into the White House? No, look, Weisha, I totally understand the question, but it is under investigation. We're going to get to the bottom to exactly what happened. The Secret Service will, not us. Uh, and so we're going to let the Secret Service do their job. I'm just not going to get ahead of, of if or, or whens or changes. We just have to let the Secret Service do their job which they are. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Gee, that's different. But honestly, is there one piece, one piece of Joe Biden's administration that is actually competent? It's a serious question, not rhetorical. I've been to the Oval Office. I've cleared security and been through the Roosevelt Room and stood in the waiting area as cabinet members streamed by. I cannot imagine what kind of, well, balls it would take to do something that bold or that stupid. And yet in Joe Biden's America, cocaine is on the menu for someone in the West Wing. And can you even believe that days into this investigation, the Secret Service cannot figure out how it got there or who brought it? Seems like a stretch to me. In the most secure building in the world, I mean, they confirmed it was cocaine pretty quick. Here's the tape, by the way, of the hazmat team confirming what they had found. Listen to this. I didn't copy your results on the Gemini. Gemini's results are new guys found. With a red bar, big match found in the library. We'll get the bag and come on up. First, the record has that we have a result on the demo. We have a yellow bar stating cocaine hydrochloride. Path number 53 dash 21 dash 4. That conclusion later confirmed by an independent laboratory, so it was not a false positive. Just another reminder that some of the folks running this place really are on drugs. And in the news media, like over at NBC, Andrew Mitchell, a lifetime Democrat bootlicker, acts as if the confirmation of cocaine in the West Wing is a surprise of some kind. Yeah, it's only a surprise because they can't blame Donald Trump for this one. Listen. 
We have just learned that a formal lab has confirmed the suspicion that that white powdery substance found in the West Wing on Sunday was, in fact, positive for cocaine. The discovery led to a brief evacuation of the White House Sunday night. Joining us now is NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli. So, Mike, where do things stand now? This is so unusual. You and I have covered the White House for years. I can't even fathom anything like this having been found before in the West Wing and I go back to the 70s at the White House. So this is pretty, pretty wild. It's absolutely extraordinary, Andrea. And this new conclusive test confirms what had been the preliminary field test conducted by D.C. fire personnel who were called in on Sunday night after the discovery of this suspicious substance by a uniformed officer in the Secret Service uh, that was conducting a routine patrol of the White House. Yep, she is just stunned. And the rest of them, like CNN, feigned their shock and surprise as well. The story continued. Here it is. All right, we do have some breaking news. Lab tests just back on the powdery substance found at the White House over the weekend have come back positive for cocaine. This substance was found. It briefly forced an evacuation there. Preliminary tests said it was cocaine. Now these other lab tests have come back. Now we should note that President Biden was at Camp David as this first unfolded over the weekend. He returned to Washington Tuesday morning. Let's go to the White House. CNS Priscilla Alvarez is there. This does raise a whole lot of questions about how the substance got there, Priscilla. It certainly does. And one of the big questions here is how it entered the White House to begin with. Now, as you mentioned, the, the, a person familiar is now confirming to our Kevin Liftak that the lab tests have shown that it is positive for cocaine. Sources had previously told CNN that field tests in the moment had determined that it was possibly cocaine. We now know that that is the case. And wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? Because only in Joe Biden's world would this be possible. Reports are now saying, quote, law enforcement sources say the culprit is unlikely to ever be caught. Really? How can they not find who left a bag of blow in the supposedly most secure building in the, in the world? If law enforcement can't figure this one out, why are we paying them? But of course, the most likely answer is law enforcement doesn't want to figure this one out, which looks more like a regular pattern around D.C. these days. You guys, uh, you might want to look the other way. Well, when it comes to some people anyway, not all people. Beyond the Secret Service, what is the White House doing? Can Corrine at least tell us the president's ticked off about the fiasco of cocaine there? Can she say that whoever they find that had the coke will face severe penalties? Good grief. Can she say something, anything, and stop being such a complete weasel about what should be fairly easy questions? Can we do that? I don't know. Let's find out. Listen. Will any White House staffers uh, will any White House staffers be undergoing drug testing as part of this investigation? So as you know, um uh, again, this is under the purview of the Secret Service, but a couple of things that I would add is that White House is subject uh, to rigorous guidelines that include drug testing, and uh, so we will take any action uh, is that is appropriate and warranted pending the outcome of the Secret Service. Just not going to get into hypotheticals from here, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, this is something that uh, when it comes to uh, drug testing, certainly we take that very seriously, uh, and so there's, uh, there are indeed rigorous guidelines here at the White House. All right, so enough about that. I mean, Joe Biden should be standing up going, this is outrageous. We're going to do something about this. Kareem should be saying that, of course. They say nothing. So what about the other bad headlines for Casey Jones and the snowplow team at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? I actually think, once again, the winner of Best in Show is Senator John Kennedy, who summed it up this way. But, but I do know this, and I think the American people can see it. The, the, uh, the, the Washington managerial elite, the establishment, if you will, is, um, is working harder than an ugly stripper to cover up whatever happened. And, and that's all that Congress is asking for is the facts. And, and to the point that they have no sense, the, the elite in Washington think that the American people don't see that they're covering up and that they're being obstructionist. Maybe it's a reflection of the contempt they have for the American people, but any fair-minded person can see that uh, that, that that our effort to get to the just the facts are, are being obstructed. Oh yes, 
Trying to cover up like an ugly stripper. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. And now the New York Post has released a video with the missing Hunter Biden witness, Dr. Gal Luft. He shot a video at an undisclosed location while still on the run detailing his allegations against the Bidens, and it all looks worse and worse for them. Dr. Luft says he was a senior advisor to Chinese energy company CEFC. At the same time, Hunter was dealing with them and getting piles of money. The DOJ did interview him back in 2019, and he says he told them about a mole within the DOJ who was sharing classified information with Hunter Biden and the Chinese in 2019. Think about that. It's long, but please take a moment and pay attention to this. But perhaps the most alarming information I revealed was of a mole within the DOJ who shared classified information with Hunter Biden and his Chinese partners. I told the DOJ that Hunter was closely associated with a very senior retire, retired FBI official who had distinct physical characteristic. He had one eye. One of the FBI agents at the time even told me, you know, that would be very easy for us to find. There aren't that many one-eyed people in the Bureau. The information I provided the FBI in March of 2019 was fully corroborated nine months later when the famous laptop belonging to Hunter Biden, which contained all the emails and receipts, was handed to the FBI. And guess who seized the laptop from the computer repair shop? It was Special Agent Joshua Wilson, who was with me in Brussels earlier. In other words, the FBI knew about, uh, from me, about the Biden CFC deals before they got hold of the laptop, way before. They had enough time to investigate the issue, but they didn't. Hope you're taking notes on all of that. Remember how they used to say the walls are closing in on Donald Trump? The walls are closing in. I think the walls are closing in all right. And it's not looking very good for the Bidens any of them right now. We'll keep you updated as it continues to roll in, that's for sure. All right, coming up after the break, the Supreme Court ruled that President Biden's loan cancellation program was unconstitutional because it was unconstitutional. But it looks like the president's looking for a way to snub the ruling and work his way around it. Adam Kissel from the Heritage Foundation will join me next to explain on America's Voice Live.
Well, you've certainly heard and know that the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's loan cancellation program as unconstitutional because it is, well, unconstitutional. But the Biden-Harris administration says it won't stop fighting for borrowers, of course, at the expense of the rest of Americans. I mean, if they're going to buy votes, they have to use your money to do it. So that's what they're going to try to do. The White House says it's going to approach loan forgiveness again, this time using the Higher Education Act of 1965. 1965. Almost 60 years ago. How does that work? Well, join me now to discuss it. Visiting fellow for the Heritage Foundation's Higher Education Reform, Adam Kissel. Adam, good to have you here. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. So what is this 1965 law they're pulling out, dusting off, and parading around? Well, it's the act that runs the higher education uh, programs of the federal government, which includes federal programs to support colleges, but also the whole federal student loan program. It gets reauthorized every so often, and it's been maybe 20 years since it's been last reauthorized, so it's overdue. But it gives the Secretary of Education uh, opportunity when the time is right to forgive a loan, to reduce a loan balance. In a case, for instance, if a college has defrauded 10,000 students, the secretary could forgive the loans of all 10,000 of those students after due process. But what I think this plan B is, is to take millions of student loans and give people money that they don't deserve just because the education department wants to give it to them. So that kind of a power I don't think could be actually found in the Higher Education Act. So just like Plan A was not within the secretary's power, Plan B is not going to be in the secretary's power either if they try to go large. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's, a, it's it's the first viable argument I've heard, though, uh, because I've met a lot of kids, and I'll say kids, people 35 or under, that have gotten college educations in recent years. They were clearly defrauded because they don't know anything about anything, Adam. I hate to be rude. These are some of the dumbest people I've ever met. Am I wrong? Well, in, if you just look at graduation rates, you see a lot of college students should not have gone to college. They couldn't finish. And now they have student debt. So you have colleges that have lied to you about whether college is going to be good for you or not. You could have a 10% graduation rate after six years and still be eligible for federal student aid dollars for your students. So until we fix the curriculum, until colleges fix graduation rates and overall quality, they do not deserve all these federal dollars. So the real answer here is dissolve the education department, privatize student loans, and at best, make student loans dependent on actual outcomes program by program of each college so that you know that you're getting a good enough deal to be able to pay your loans back. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Uh, when the, the bulk of student loans, in fact, almost all of them went into government control in 2009 under the administration of Barack Obama, the price of college began to skyrocket, spiral out of control. The education costs went up. The value went down. Students were being screwed. There's no question about that. And this is true. I mean, when you have a student loan that you pay your monthly minimum month after month after month after month and years go by, and the balance really has not changed. We need to change the way that those loans are structured because what the government did under Barack Obama was create cash cows, millions of them, creating cash flow to the federal government. That does need to be corrected. That doesn't mean forgiving student loan debt, but we ought to make it possible so that grandma is not paying off her student loans. Would you agree with that? That's right. The, the way we collect student loans through the federal student aid office doesn't make any sense. So loan None. balances go up and up. And instead, just charge people more per month so they can pay off their loans and they can be more fiscally responsible with their budget as they go forward in life. So uh, right now we subsidize colleges through subsidizing loans. We're enabling colleges to raise their tuition. And we find that for every dollar, I think the Fed of New York found that for every dollar that we subsidize tuition, colleges take 60 cents of that in, uh, in higher tuition. So Well, yeah. Uh, so I mean, you, have you been to a college lately? Big colleges? I mean, they've got these massive food courts and entertainment places. They, they, look like, they look like places like Disney used to look like. I mean, these are resorts, not colleges. Look, I did the college tour here a couple of years ago. You know what they were selling me? Food plans and rooms. Not an education. Hey, if you come here, you get an education, you'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. I never heard them talk about education. I heard them talk about meal plans and snacks and what kind of room you're going to get. And what kind of fancy amenities were in your room? 
Uh, we've got this all upside down. All of it, Adam. All of it. What do you say? Well, who's supposed to be concerned about college quality? It's the accreditors. It's the ones who vouch for you to let you get student aid as a college. The accreditors around the country have let down the American people because they are not doing their job and keeping quality control up. So we need to reform the accreditation system as well as all the rest. I have a solution, by the way, that I'll leave folks with. I'll let you respond to it and give you the last word on this. My solution is this. If a university, whatever it is, says student A, B, and C, you're going to come to our university, we're going to get you to take these student loans, make that university co-sign for those loans so that when two or three or five years down the road, those kids can't pay their student loans because they can't get a job that's related to the degree that they paid so much money for, then that's, that, that institution of higher education is on the hook with them. I'll give you the last yeah. word. Well, your word was entirely right. So risk sharing by colleges, whether it's through required degree insurance or what you suggested or some other options are all good options for making sure that colleges have skin in the game so that when they graduate a student who's not ready, it's partly their fault. It's not just on the exactly. shoulders of the students and the taxpayers. Make them co-sign it. Most of these universities have, have endowments worth billions of dollars, billions of dollars. Put your money on the line. If you think that education is worth what you're charging for it, then you co-sign with that kid who's coming out of high school. Adam, that's my solution for the day. I thank you for being here. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. All right. Good to have you. All right. After the break, the liberal media crying because a judge revoked left-wing censorship privileges. Oh, the humanity of it. We'll have that story more after the break. is among those not hailing Judge Doty's latest decision very well. The judge issuing a preliminary injunction that prohibits government employees from pressuring social media companies to censor Americans, to censor anything. And the left, well, its head is just exploding. Over on CNN, Ellie Honig called the ruling dramatic and aggressive. Whatever. Here it is. 
It, it's a dramatic uh, decision by this judge. If you read through it, he's citing to literature and George Washington and Ben Franklin. Here's what really is astonishing to me. This is a conservative ideology that clearly comes through in this decision. It's a conservative political ideology, right? We saw some of the quotes questioning vaccines, questioning masks, conservative talking points. But the ruling itself is the opposite of judicial conservatism. This is one of the most aggressive, far-reaching rulings you'll ever see. What's really remarkable is the fact that that guy has a job on TV being an expert in anything. Meanwhile, over on MSNBC, history professor Walter Isaacson says he's used to the government controlling what the media can or cannot say and thinks the judge went too far, even while admitting that unlawful censorship uh, occurred and continues to occur. Listen. Right, and I think Judge Daugherty's decision goes too far. We're in the press. We're always used uh, to people from the government saying, hey, don't print that. But what the Twitter file showed, and in my book I talk about the night after night when they're releasing these files, is that it went a bit far. It wasn't just government saying don't uh, print things or uh, amplify things about, say, uh, the uh, Barrington Doctrine, which talks about the spread of COVID, it was somehow coercing a bit. And what was worse, the social media companies didn't just play along, they colluded and tried to stop some of the flow of information. So I think this is a little bit of a corrective, but I really feel that in the end, the decision will be refined somewhat because government has to have the right to have its own free speech to push back when they see things on social media they think are dangerous. So, wait, wait, wait a second. The government has to have its own free speech by censoring others. That's what he just said right there. The government has to have its own free speech by not allowing you to speak. Remarkable. Over on NBC, Ryan Riley says the government actually doesn't. January 6th, of course. Listen. Way. And if you look at the reality, it's like the FBI is not very good at monitoring social media. Just look at what happened on January 6th. There are all of these warning signs, red flags going up all over the place, and they weren't prepared. They didn't do enough. They did not take proper precautions or instruct other law enforcement agencies to make proper precautions. So I think that that's the framework you have to remember that this is important to look by. I mean, this opinion, this 55, 155 page opinion, starts off with a, essentially a big if true comment. It says, okay, if these things are true, this is one of the biggest First Amendment abuses in American history. And I suppose so, if it were true, <laughs> but that's not necessarily where the facts are lining up with and how exactly, what exactly the evidence shows that uh, social media companies, how they were interacting with at least the FBI. Yeah, that guy is lost. Media outlets like these have been counting on social media companies to back their narrative for so many years that anything different scares them, as it should. The truth will make its way out whether they like it or not. Meanwhile, U.S. Customs and Border Protection report reveals that the agency released an illegal migrant that was on the terrorist watch list into the United States. I'm sure there are more, but they're admitting this one. And then it took more than two weeks to arrest the guy. The report details the mishap, starting with the CBP's apprehension of the individual and his family, who were released two days later on April the 19th, 2022, because according to the Office of Inspector General, quote, CBP's ineffective practices and processes for resolving inclusive matches with the terrorist watch list led to multiple mistakes. Two days later, two days later, the FBI's terrorist screening center confirmed that the individual was a terrorist listed. But due to various complications and challenges, it took two weeks to find him again and give him bracelets again. Anyhow, back to the news after a break and a message from our sponsor, Birch Gold. With Joe Biden in the Oval Office, we've seen inflation surge and deficit spending and the national debt have hit record highs. It's directly because of these challenges that President Trump recently warned, quote, our currency is crashing and soon no longer will be the standard of the world, which will be our greatest defeat in 200 years. Now, in a direct affront to the dollar status as global reserve currency, the BRICS group of nations led by China and Russia are rumored to be just two months away from launching their own currency. With the dollar seemingly on its last legs, it's more important than ever to take a hard look at moving some of your savings to gold. And you can own gold in a tax-sheltered retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. 
That's right. Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into an IRA in gold. And the best part, you don't pay a penny out of pocket, not one. So how do you get started? Well, Birch Gold is giving away a free information kit on gold. Just text the word America to 989898. Think about this. When currencies fail, gold is a safe haven. How much more time does the dollar have, especially with bricks looming ominously overhead? We don't know. Protect your savings with gold right now. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. Text America to the number 989898. Get your free information kit on gold. Do it right now. Again, text America to 989898. All right. Uh, up after the break, rather than reporting those who engage in illegal sexual activity with minors, teachers' unions are concealing the abuse in a method they call passing the trash. What's trash, all right? The founder of Telios Law, Teresa Sidebotham, will join me to explain coming up next on ABL. You know, despite a lot of attention, parental outcry, and concerns, sexual abuse still happening in public schools across the country at an all-too-regular, in fact, at an alarming rate. Federal data documents revealed that between 2010 and 2019, the number of complaints filed with the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights alleging sexual violence against K-12 schools more than tripled. More than tripled. Unfortunately, a terrible trend within public school administrations has come to light a practice called passing the trash. Rather than reporting faculty and staff who engage in illegal sexual activity with minors, local teacher union leaders are concealing the abuse and permitting accused employees to resign and move to a new school district. Here to explain how this could even happen is Teresa Sidebotham, who is the founder of Telios Law. Teresa, good to see you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I mean this is... This is the worst possible scenario. Oh, we've got a teacher here, male or female, doesn't matter, abusing kids in middle school or high school or maybe even elementary school. And, and, and my first question is, how are they not in jail? But they're not because deals get made and plea bargains are met. And then they move on to the next school. 
and the same thing repeats itself. It's just awful. Tell me about it. Well, it is. Mandatory reporting laws are being disregarded. Uh, one government study showed that up to 10% of children in public schools are victims of sexual misconduct from educators over the span of their time you know, in school. So, so it's tragic. There's not the accountability. There's... Um, you know, there's some administrative agency action, but it's not effective. There's no real penalty on the public schools if they don't deal with the issue. There's laws in place that are being disregarded. And often the teachers' unions' bargaining agreements include provisions that make it really hard to get these allegations in the file and take action on them. It, it just ends up... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if laws are being violated... How, how can they just get away with that? You would think that somebody would file a lawsuit. Somebody would hire a lawyer. Somebody would call the police. How, how is this just getting sidestepped all the way through? Personal injury lawyers don't focus much on government agencies because it's so hard to sue the government. There's short notice provisions. There's different types of governmental immunity. And, you know, frankly, it's much easier to go after a religious organization like the Catholic Church. The press is obviously focused much more attention on abuse in religious organizations. But statistically, the number of victims in the public schools dwarfs any religious organization out there. But there just hasn't been the public attention to it, which is why I'm so glad that you're talking about it. Yeah, of course, they don't want to admit that in the newsrooms around uh, the major media outlets, do they? That, you know, it's not the Christian organizations, it's not the Catholic organizations, it's the teachers unions who are protecting more pedophiles and more criminals than anybody else. That's what you're telling me, Teresa. Abuse happens in any human organization, but without good accountability, it's going to continue to happen. And it's, it's kind of a perfect storm between the fact that it's hard to fire public school employees, that it's expensive to do it. Uh, there's mandatory reporting laws that they're, they're not always following. So it's easier for them to pass the trash, to let the person resign and go on to another school district. And, you know, the, the studies show that they may wind up in several different school districts over their career. On average, some of these people may be abusing, you know, 70 plus kids each. So we really do whoa, need- Whoa, 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 stop right there. They're abusing how many kids? Some of them are abusing over 70 kids each because they're pedophiles. Some of them have repeated. And they're not in jail. They're, they haven't not, been fired. They're still getting paid. They're still getting the opportunity to be around more children and more children. That is the most gut-wrenching thing I have heard in weeks. In weeks. It's awful. They, what's happening is, you know, the reason they know about some of these people is eventually, yes, they do get put in jail, but there's dozens of kids before that and they go back into the past and, you know, it may have started 20 and 30 years before. And then not just in any one particular state, but all around the country, it's happening because it is so hard to hold government agencies accountable. They're hard to sue. It's so hard to get laws passed in the states to stop them because of interests like the teachers union. There are federal laws, but there's no teeth in them. Um, you know, the Office of Civil Rights isn't enforcing it. Really, all they can do is they can either take away the school's money or not take away the school's money. But there isn't a case-by-case -case enforcement. There's not much individual accountability. So unless there's a public outcry and people call for state laws and people call for real pen penalties against people who don't obey mandatory reporting laws, it's going to keep happening. Yeah, we have to put some teeth in those laws, apparently, because if you get caught not doing what you were required to do with mandatory reporting laws, there should be stiff penalties for that. Teresa, I'll give you the last word. There should be stiff penalties. There's nothing more important than keeping our children safe, and it's not being done adequately. And yes, we should all care about that deeply. Teresa Sidebotham, Telios Law, she founded. Um, eye-opening, to say the least. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing. As tough as it's been to hear. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Wow. Well, California's on its way to banning all tobacco products. 
What do people say about that? Well, Brandon Franks of the Industrial Cigar Company, he says, not so fast. We'll talk about it up next on America's Voice Live. substances, it seems like public enemy number one is tobacco. Every year, products such as cigarettes are responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of individuals across the station. 500,000 people die from tobacco-related diseases every year, most notably cigarettes. Being the trailblazing state that it is, California now looking at a bill that would eventually ban the sale of all tobacco products. I guess weed, it's just fine. It's good for the little boys and girls, just not tobacco. California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a similar bill in 2020 that banned the sale and flavored tobacco products in the state. Joining me now, though, is Brandon Frakes. He is one of the owners of the Industrial Cigar Company. You see their logo right there. They'll be the first cigar lounge in the world to offer DoorDash, to have cigars delivered to people's doorstep immediately. Sir, good to have you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, well, Brandon, first of all, tell me about your company. Tell me about this company that you spend in the family. Our company is a family-owned business. We've been around for six years. Um, it started as a hobby, turned into a passion, turned into a business. And now we, I'm, I'm proud to sit in our growing business. As you look over to this side, you find a big hole in it because we are growing. And what we've noticed is there's something special happening in the cigar industry, and we're just we're proud to be a part of it. And as you look at these laws being passed around, because if California does it, then Illinois will do it. New York will do it. Massachusetts will do it to ban all tobacco products. I think it's unlikely because politicians and government are addicted to tobacco taxes and the money that flows in. But they're talking about it. What would that mean to you? Well, I think it's I think it's very important for us to look at what the core is. And as we see it from from a California perspective, I think we have an education issue. And it would be a shame if we tried to fix an an education issue 
by creating an economic issue. And what I mean by that is there's a vast difference between cigars, cigarettes, vape, marijuana, fill in the blank, right? A big difference between all of them. And what this does is it shows that we're just gonna throw a blank on everything, regardless of what the reality is. And the real, I think the real shame with this is if they start, is they're not looking at playing it through. What I mean by that is, think about the countries in Honduras, Nicaragua, the Dominican, even though we can't buy Cuban cigars, just look at where that would track itself out to be. And we're talking, we're talking economies that can go down from a national level if this was to to take place across the country. Yeah, it would really hurt people. So uh, your message is smoke them if you got them, which is fine. It's a cigar. Uh, and I think it's a perfectly fine business to be in. Now, you've got something else that's happening that could boost your business, regardless of what California does. You've got a new play. Tell us about it. We have a new plan, and I am proud to announce that we are partnering with DoorDash to be the first ever brick and mortar family owned cigar lounge that will offer cigar delivery direct to your doorstep. We're in the far north Dallas area, and we all understand that there is a barrier of entry to cigars and it is a bit intimidating, but for us, it's our responsibility to break down those barriers and make it easy, convenient, and enjoyable for you to enjoy a cigar, those of age, of course, uh, and what better way to do it than by bringing it straight to your doorstep. Yeah, no, I mean, they, they deliver alcohol to these folks uh, and these uh, shopping uh, uh, companies, so why not cigars too? Uh, obviously, there has to be an age check, same way it is when they deliver alcohol to people's houses, but there it is. Do you expect that um, trend, the, this thing that you've created, to go across the country? I'll give you the last word. Yes, I, I believe so, and that's the beauty of it, is we, we're really trying to really trailblaze the way for the rest of the industry, which uh, has a tendency to be stuck in the ways that it's been for the past 60, 70 years. And what we're doing in this partnership is developing the menu structure, the technology and everything. So retailers nationwide can take the ball, run with it, and hopefully start making some real national push. And we're just proud to be the ones that are that are taking on the first lift. Well. I think it's uh, a good first step for you, Brandon. Thank you for being here. It is the Industrial Cigar Company. If you want to go find out more, sir, again, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll get back to the news after this quick break and a message from our sponsor, My Patriot Supply. Folks, if you think you don't need emergency food, think again. The government recently said that there could be shortages here. You've got problems with uh, drought, you've got problems with shortages of fertilizer, problems in the industrial part of farming. And that means food is going to be scarce and expensive, potentially. Is your family prepared for that? If not, now is the time to stock up on emergency food for My Patriot Supply at discount prices. Now, go to preparewithrav.com and you'll save big on each four week emergency food kit you need for your family. Each one, you'll get breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks, snacks just to keep the people going. Best of all, this food is delicious. Your whole family's going to love it, I'll tell you that. Uh, save big on each four-week kit you need. Go to preparewithrav.com and get free shipping. What could be easier? You'll never forgive yourself if your family suffers. Go to preparewithrav.com right now. Get stocked up for the unknown, all right? After the break, we will have a story that reminds us of how wonderful America is. Plus, your answers to our America's Voice question of the day. Who do you think dropped the bag of blow in the White House? Hmm.
You see, America is wonderful because we love to make dreams come true. And every day I want to make you happy for a little bit. We like to invent things because we're cool and cool things are cool. You get it? Check out this insane new addition to the Las Vegas Strip if you haven't seen it. When I write an urgent letter to Gandalf, it really is something to see. Look at this thing. The MGM Sphere cost a mere $2.3 billion to create and lit up for the first time on Tuesday for the 4th of July. Look at that thing. It is essentially a huge circular screen with 1.2 million LED lights spanning 366 feet and 516 feet wide. It will open to the public in about three months for concerts and other events. I mean, are you inside this thing? I think you must be inside it, right, for this event. The first concert scheduled will be the band U2. Apparently, Elvis has left the building, but look at that. Um, way to go, Vegas. Or should I say... Viva Las Vegas. Okay, that's the end of my singing for the day. Okay, good. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys saying stop. All right, who do you think dropped the bag of blow in the White House? <clears throat> Dorothy Butcher. Hunter. Caitlin Swazo. Laugh my effing off. Is that really a question? We know where it came from. Bill Wren. Politicians. The only explanation for their lack of accomplishing anything except waste of taxpayers' money and getting Rich off deep corruption. Snorted up there, Casey Jones. Corey Strode, hopefully Joe OCBJ could use a pick-me-up. That's what I'm saying. A big blast and a cup of, uh, of black coffee. Whoosh, away he goes. Gene Cruz, maybe it was, well, what's his name? Debbie Seaman, we will never know the truth. Everything the Bidens do is covered up. Yeah. Laura Edmonds writes, I have two thoughts. One. Hunter left a stash for somebody to pick up and they dropped some. Or two, Hunter didn't get all his stuff before heading off with Daddy. Well, I don't think the smartest man alive would have done this. He would have somebody else do it for him, and if in fact it has anything to do with him. And Sal Patain, I'm 100% sure somehow they'll blame Trump for it. That's what I said, Sal. Here comes another indictment on the expense of the poor taxpayers. Uh, we'll leave it right there for the day. Listen, if you want to drop me a line... Go to stevegruber.com. Send me a note. Tell me what's going on in your neck of the woods. Love what we're doing. Hate what we're doing here on ABL. Let me know. stevegruber.com. Send it on over. I'll read. I read all messages. Join me tomorrow morning to kick off your day here on RAV with the Steve Gruber Show. Six o'clock. We just do the black coffee part, not the cocaine. All right. All right. And then later in the day, we'll be here for AVL. Don't miss it. <laughs>